401-403-C1. Uh, <laughs> Help me out there. 501-C3. <laughs> and um, uh, <laughs> thank you, 401-C3. I know, it was in my adult brain somewhere. And so that's been in existence for more than four years. We have been offering uh, every month a speaker series at the library, and we hope to get back to that in person as soon as we're through COVID. Um, as you know, Car Carquinas Village is an organization. Uh, we're not a, we are a virtual village that allows seniors to age in their own homes and to stay in place. And we have just a wonderful membership in Benicia and have been very supported by the city. So we are so pleased to welcome Mayor Elizabeth uh, Patterson for, I don't know, soon to be one of her last speeches, at least to our group, as mayor of our fair city, as she is coming to the end of her term. Uh, so with no further ado, um, I think, will you mute all of us, Susan, and then we will unmute when we want to have questions? Sounds good. Great. With no further ado, then, Elizabeth Patterson. All right, so I'm actually going to do a little intro. Um, talk a little bit about Elizabeth. Okay. Elizabeth has always been such a strong supporter uh, of our village and from in, before its inception and really encouraged uh, us to in our beginnings and has always been so generous with her time and um, help to the village. So she's a very special guest for us. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about her. Uh, she, uh, Mayor Patterson has served on the Venetia City Council since 2003. She was elected mayor in 2007 and then re-elected in 2011 and 2016. She actually um, was mayor when I first moved to Benicia. She was chair of the general plan oversight committee for three years from beginning to end and served on the planning commission. Mrs. Ms. Patterson currently serves on several regional boards, including the Solano Transportation Authority Board, Sol Trans Joint Powers Authority Board, Marine Clean Energy, North Bay Watershed Association, and the Solana Water Agency Board. Ms. Patterson was born in Los Angeles and grew up in the San Gabriel Valley. She moved to Northern California in 1968 and lived on a ranch in San Luis Obispo and then in New York for five years before returning to the Bay Area. Elizabeth has lived in Benicia since 1983, where she raised her two girls and one large dog. Ms. Patterson has been a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners and a planning director for two Bay Area towns. Elizabeth has been involved in several regional and local issues involving conflict resolution to reach consensus for planning and managing urban and natural resource assets. She was the executive director of the Partnership for Regional Livability, a project for the White House Task Force on Livable Communities during the Clinton-Gore administration. Elizabeth is proud of her work to create in, in 1992 the first new state agency in 20 years, resulting in the Delta Protection Commission while she was at the California State Lands Commission. She is equally proud of her work to establish the Benicia Arts and Cultural Commission the Sustainability Commission, and a cool California camp champion. Ms. Patterson has worked before and within the state Senate on watershed legislation, and she works as a retired employee for the California State Department of Water Resources on land use and integrated water management. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, mute all participants and turn it over to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, give me one second, because sometimes I end up muting you too. Okay. <laughs> there we go. So um, just to add to that, so I still work as a retired annuitant with the Department of Water Resources. And last month, um, we, we have our regular meetings by uh, remote, like everybody else. And something came up and there was a woman who also was working for many, many years as a retired annuitant. And she, but she, she said she'd done all her home improvement projects. And so she was done working as a retired annuitant. I thought that was very funny. And so then I said, well, you guys need to think about me. 
And my, my direct report guy says, well, we just thought you were here forever. And I said, Paul, forever gets shorter and shorter every year. <laughs> so I actually am working on a project of succession. And if anyone has some suggestions, let me know. Anyway, um, what I wanted to get into today is I, I was advised that you, you're kind of interested in what the city uh, ha is doing with older adults and what it might be doing. I want to talk about what is on the next council agenda, which is the 25th, I think, uh, and that's the Black Lives Matter uh, policy document that we're coming up with, and I'll share some of the details on that. And then I want to talk a little bit about budget because everybody um, kind of tunes out when uh, the council gets into budget issues, but of course it's our lifeblood for all the services that the city provides. So let's talk about older adults. Um, the, from a planning perspective, we, we could do much more. In, in providing for older adults. And uh, simple things like um, adopting the Uniform Building Code, there is a provision in the adoption of the Uniform Building Code that adopts what's called universal standards. So instead of a doorknob, it's a door handle. Instead of, uh, and then their heights on counters are designed for the, uh, this, this actually came about through um, the, American Disability Act and so it's kind of dealing with people that might be challenged with certain physical things but it works for a lot of us older adults as well so um, so in my discussions with um, a couple of you uh, we we wanted a more robust program for the city but as you know everything kind of has grinded to a halt because of the COVID situation but prior to that, I was able to get a commitment in public uh, and on record that the next time we adopt the Uniform Building Code, we will adopt the uni uh, universal standards. And that does take an act by uh, the council. So um, my advice is that you get in writing your interests in that and as an organization, and then be sure to put in the writing that you want to be contacted with any in, um, actions, study sessions, and what have you that might uh, involve that. And that actually gives you standing so that if you don't get noticed, you can actually ask for a rehearing uh, if, the, if it isn't taken. Um, but I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for older adult needs in the city. Um, after all, we are an older community. And, and our planning director, new planning director, is very much aware of these issues. He comes from uh, Santa Monica for 19 years. There, uh, for those who may not know, that is a, considered a very progressive community in planning. Uh, they, they are one of the few communities in California that actually meets their affordable housing needs. Uh, it's all in perspective. I mean, if you think about the cost of housing in Santa Monica, meeting affordable housing needs means that most of us might qualify for low, low affordable housing in Santa Monica. But the fact that they met it, and they did it with a tax measure, they tax themselves every year, gets renewed once in a while, because I think it has, um, it has a time limit on it. And that pays for the subsidies that are necessary for the kind of housing that a lot of older adults need. And it's not something the development community likes to build because they don't get a return on their investment um, as they can for building the, the large square footage type things or the condominiums. So to, to, to get the affordable housing for older adults uh, generally requires some kind of subsidy. Uh, you can extract it from some development agreements, but um, that's really a very slow slog and uh, generally only yields about 10% of a complex for affordable housing. There are exceptions. So as the rule of thumb is what you want to do is figure out a way to subsidize affordable housing for older adults. It's a easier project to get approved because people are more sympathetic to older adults. And when you say affordable housing generally, uh, it strikes the fear of God into people thinking that that means um, other folks will come in that are not desirable. Well, of course, that's not true. 
so, but you had to spend a lot more time and energy and effort to convince the neighborhood and uh, the surroundings. So senior housing has a, uh, is the term that we use. It has um, many advantages for our community because we've determined that very few uh, single family units are actually at a level um, where you don't have any stairs. My house, for instance, I, when I bought it, it never even occurred to me. I loved the fact that I had stairs um, outside to get to. And in the house, I did that deliberately. I wanted the exercise going up and down. Well, what does that mean to me today? It means I have friends who can't come visit me, and except maybe during the summer, and they don't have to use stairs to get into my backyard. So these things matter. The, they're, they're not details to overlook. Advocacy for that is really important, and that's what I see the Carquinez Village role. Um, as I said, the planning department is uh, aware of these issues and sympathetic, but um, because of COVID, we are pretty focused on getting uh, businesses to get some temporary permits or permanent permit permits to um, be able to serve food outside and to have retail that's accessible. And the council has been really great on this, um, very unified um, in, in getting the staff to move forward as quickly as possible so that we maintain the integrity of our historic uh, structures and districts, but we make it easier and streamlined uh, for these changes to take place. So that's what we focused on. And then, um, uh, so, the, so the issues that we had talked about with the steering committee that we had with Kirkina's Village um, are still important, but we won't be addressing them until things settle down with the planning department needs for these other concerns. And at the end of the day, what will the city's budget look like in terms of addressing that? And so when I get to the budget and infrastructure, just sort of keep that thought in mind. Um, there are other issues about um, aging in place that uh, the short term are the universal standards, the midterm is actually encouraging development for older adults. And the third is the more adventuresome type of ideas, community, cute, sort of communal living, not like the hippies and when I was growing up, but more along the lines that you see in um, Davis. And I think you probably all know that story. And so, older adults who maybe work together or play bocce ball together, whatever, they know one another. And so they've collectively gone in and built a community and hugely successful. So we could think about that. We have the opportunity to do that in Venetia. Um, there are, so there's a, a host of planning issues that can be addressed for older adults. One of the things that we want to do is focus on some of the uh, success stories that Lafayette has had. And, um, and that, took a, that takes a little bit more investment. Because we're an aging community, these investments are necessary and essential. Uh, it's just that we've been hit with a few things that make it really difficult for us to do it on our own. Um, so what I think that the future is, is that we're going to have partnerships with the county. And I do serve on the board. I forgot to put that on my list. I serve on the board for the uh, Aging Adult uh, Agency, and where I was appointed by Supervisor Brown. And this is taking federal money that is funneled through the state that then is distributed and spent for uh, services in uh, both its Napa and Solano. It's the combined uh, jurisdiction. And that provides for transportation, for Meals on Wheels, and for uh, fall, fall, falling uh, prevention and, and other services. Um, so we, we definitely can partner with the county on that and, um, and then we'll also be seeking additional funds from the state. Uh, we have a governor who understands the aging adult. And he, prior to the COVID, he actually had the most money uh, in his budget for dealing with those issues. He did not um, subtract from the funds. He simply didn't include the additional funds that he had originally proposed. 
So in what they call the um, May revise, where he has to get agreement with the legislature, there was no cut to these funds, but we didn't get the increases that we wanted to see because um, the existing funds are inadequate. Um, so again, um, COVID has changed all of this and, and I'm not too sure what the future holds, but he is committed to, to meeting the older adult needs at all, all levels. So, um, the next item then, and as a, if you have any questions, be sure to write them down and then I'll, I'll get to them. Uh, the next item is the Black Lives Matter. So we had two very successful um, protest marches uh, Benicia style, no violence, uh, lots of really good speeches. Um, I had a great opportunity to meet one of the leaders. There were two, there were two groups. One was a youth led and then one was uh, by um, older uh, folks. And one was um, this woman, Nimat, who turns out to be a planner. So she and I just hit it off really well. And I said, well, what do you want from the city? So they've been working, uh, Nimat and Brandon have our co-leads per my suggestion. Um, I did offer a different name for what they were doing. Uh, they have a group that's been meeting, some of you probably are in that group, and they chose uh, Benicia Black Lives Matters, and that's fine. Um, uh, so when I asked what they wanted, I said, what are your immediate objectives and what, are you, you know, what, what can we do as a city? to get things going and not just give nice words. Uh, I'm tired of nice words, frankly. And so they came up with a list and, the, and I said, well, why don't you work with staff so that it's, it comes from staff and you know, kind of get the politics out of it a little bit. And so that's, going to, that's our next council meeting next week. And, um, and it's the first step, it's not the last step. And what we wanna see are some concrete changes uh, that are necessary. Uh, to give you an example, uh, there is a proposition on the ballot in November, which is to change Proposition 206, which was passed when the Wilson administration. Um, and it says you can't, it's, it, most people think it says you can't consider race and gender and uh, minority status in hiring and in other things and um, affecting the universities and what have you. Well, we always thought, I'm in the public sector, I always thought that meant you couldn't advertise that you were interested in uh, women or you were interested in minorities or blacks or brown and, and, um, and tribal interests. And it turns out that you can indicate that. You just can't use that as a quota and you can't use that as a determination. And Oakland has provided a roadmap for how you avoid uh, going over the edge on the restrictions on Prop 206. Nonetheless, there is legislation that was passed in the legislature to put this proposition on the ballot, which will uh, constitutionally modify things so it gives us more freedom. So what does that mean? Our police department has overwhelmingly overrepresentation of women and minorities in when you compare our police department with the rest of the city's structure. And that was, um, you know, hadn't been pointed out to us, but when it was pointed out to us, we were all feeling like we need to do something about that. So in this policy document that's online now, you will see that commitment. We are creating an, uh, an office, a place in the city managers, well, if this is passed, uh, we will be creating a place, a uh, position in the city manager's office for a fairness and equity person, and that they will, they will work toward uh, making sure that we um, advertise in different places, not the usual places that we advertise uh, for jobs and what have you. Keep in mind that our businesses in town, most of the, our small businesses, the ones that make us feel like we're Benicia and special, Think about how many of them are run by women. And they have a hard time getting loans from the big banks. They have to deal with the local financial opportunities. 
same thing with our black businesses and, and so forth. So that's what we're going to be focused on is getting some concrete things um, doing. I very much invite you to take a look at that. I'll send it out on my e-alert so that you have a link to what's being proposed. And as I said, it's a first step. It's not a last step. It'll be a living kind of resolution and we'll uh, amend it as necessary. We're all learning at this. Um, there were things that were uh, revealed to me that I hadn't thought about that, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I was just insensitive to some of the things that um, I've done and we've been doing. So I'm really excited about this. Um, and I think that we are gonna make a lot of progress in the city and we and will be Venetia proud in what we do. Um, the last item is the budget. So I, I don't, unless you've been living in a cave, I don't think uh, anyone is surprised that the city revenues have been hit and hit hard, uh, but not as hard as a lot of other communities. So um, as my, my daughter said to me recently, you know, I was kind of complaining about a lot of stuff and um, it's, it's hard for when you care so much about your community and you wanna provide for those who can't provide for themselves and you wanna, you wanna do the things that make Venetia the special place it is. We had just um, gone through a process, which I'll go into a little bit of details, but uh, so in my conversation with my daughter who lives in Oakland, talk about under siege, and uh, she says, well, at least we're not Beirut. And I thought, okay, well, I can put that in perspective. Um, so here's the deal. We um, have a, a city manager who's been with us for three years, and I, I would consider her the most qualified city manager that I have ever worked with. And keep in mind, I've been a planning director, so not only did I work with city managers as a staff person, and I actually represented the city manager at meetings, and then, and then of course, here in my office, so as mayor. So, um, she, uh, a year and a half ago, she, uh, we were getting ready to do a two-year budget, and she didn't understand the, um, how each of the departments did their budget, and so she said, I want you to build your budget from the ground up, and they hadn't done this for 12 years or so, maybe even longer. And at the end of that exercise, the departments looked at all their needs, their staffing needs, most of our costs are staffing costs, and came up with uh, savings. And if you combine all the departments, we basically, she found about $20 million of kind of quote, one-time saved funds, and, uh, and that we hadn't assigned the 20 million toward anything. Now, why, why? And the simple answer is that each department, I've done these, you know, you get your departments, you had last year's budget and you look at inflation and you always have um, ideals of getting more staff in. And so each department would had a tendency, because I've done this, is you add 10%. And that was what was happening. They were adding 10%, what well, 10% one year and then 10% another year, and your costs have actually gone up a little bit. So that's what happened. So we had, uh, at the end of the day, we had not quite $20 million. And for years since I got elected in 2003, I've been trying to get certain things accomplished and uh, beyond what I am said I was most proud of. And uh, so finally, we were able to find money to do some of these things. And there were other interests that other council members had as well. Um, such a, you know, some of the things we don't pay very well in the city of Benicia. And that may come as a surprise to a lot, a lot of folks in Benicia, but we don't. It's really, we're not competitive. And because we're not competitive, um, it's hard to attract the A team. And so we have been thinking about ways we can augment salaries and make it more attractive for folks, particularly the younger ones. They've got student debt, they have young families, housing costs are high. So if we want to get uh, the A-team, uh, we, we need to be creative about how we can provide uh, competitive salaries or benefits or um, other things. And so the city manager came up with a proposal and that was what we were going to fund. It was a way to, without having to go back, you don't want to go back and renegotiate um, union agreements, not now. Um, and so we, we figured this out and
and I, I, I'm hoping that the council agrees to move forward on that when we get into the budget discussion uh, that later this month and then next month. Um, it's iffy about some of the council think that maybe we should cut the salaries of staff, which means that we'll lose staff and and that puts us behind. Um, another item in the budget was putting more money into the Family Resource Center. Typically, we fund it to about $50,000 a year. We added $50,000 and through this uh, unassigned funds, and we added another $50,000 uh, when uh, we were dealing with some of the COVID impacts at the very beginning. Um, more money is necessary as people are food insecure and uh, parents are having a hard time with what to do with the children at home and keeping their jobs um, when the children can't go to school. So there are just incredible needs. So I suspect that in our budget discussion, we will be addressing that and how to augment that. That's all coming out of this one time assigned, at this point it was assigned money, but we're taking the assignments away from what we had agreed to. Um, and so there are some fundamental policy issues that we have to address on the policy budget discussions that will be coming up in, as I said, the next couple of months. Uh, we we uh, know what our revenue loss was for the fiscal year that ended on at the end of June. And that was a little less than we had anticipated. It was closer to 2 million. We thought it would be over 2 million. Uh, and the revenue loss is due naturally to for mostly the commercial First Street foods and retail. And that they represent about 10 to 12% of the city's revenues, sales tax revenue. And so the other revenue loss was out in the industrial sector because they also were shut down, except for the refinery. But even the refinery had uh, cut back, dialed down because there wasn't um, the same demand. So, however, we think there's been some recovery in the industrial park. All indications are there, uh, which is good because that's the bulk of where we get our sales tax and excise tax revenues. And then First Street, we're um, we, we don't have the latest data, of course, it's too soon, but we were projecting for this fiscal year, that would take us into 2021, we were projecting about an eight and a half million dollar revenue loss out of a discretionary fund of about $35 million. So you can see that is a significant hit. Um, other cities, were a much less good condition than Benicia. They didn't have one-time funds to draw on. They were already into their reserves for a variety of reasons. We uh, haven't had to go into our reserves. We are prepared to do so with a proper policy discussion. Um, so these are heavy lifting items that we need to be addressing. We provide a lot of services in the city of Benicia. Uh, we're considered a high service town and we want to maintain that that's our quality of life but now the services are more of simply life it's making sure that from everybody from those who are uh, food insecure our young folks our older adults who are isolated uh, because of the coronavirus we need to provide services for that so we have some serious budget discussions coming up um, and I'll just share with you my philosophy. So uh, without an, any embarrassment whatsoever, I uh, was telling Susan earlier, I would uh, have a degree in history and I focused on two areas of interest to all of you, I suppose maybe three areas. I really liked reading about the Civil War, couldn't believe the things I did read. Um, and I was a pretty good uh, scholar on the Civil War. Uh, American history, a little weak on the revolution, I'm trying to catch up on that. Um, and my second area of, of interest was pre-Soviet history. You can see it's done me a lot of good. Um, and so um, in studying American history, the, um, to study the depression and what it was like before the depression, the, the um, gilded age, 
you know, I thought, here I am, a kid in the 60s, and I'm reading, people lived like that? They did that to one another? Why, well, that's outrageous. We would never do that. And here we are with the biggest uh, gap, income gap, since the 1920s, corruption, run amok, and what have you. And so my idea um, about, um, first of all, my career was to, to, to do what I always thought was the finest thing you could do, and that's be a public servant. And so that's why I generally mostly worked in, in a government capacity, providing those public services. Um, that I was losing track of time here. And so um, it's clear that, um, that what, what worked really well in terms of getting out of the depression was putting people to work at all kinds of things, building bridges, uh, fixing parks, building parks, uh, fixing homes, and on and on and on. And so it's really clear to me that government is the last resort when the private sector can't or won't, then government is the, the tool that we use to get us out of uh, economic desperation. And, um, and, it, and it worked really well. There are uh, exceptions to all of these stories, but it worked really well. And we have seen that the development of the middle class uh, in the 50s and 60s and early 70s was a direct result of the investment in education, in infrastructure, in public health. All of these things were invested in by government funds. So I feel that that's where we should really concentrate our effort. And I am discouraged when I hear uh, other council members talk about cutting salaries of staff. I don't think that helps morale. I don't think that gives staff the desire to be working their little behinds off uh, day in and day out, be, uh, which is the result of COVID and trying to do the regular job. And then in addition to that, do it, doing it with more difficulties and then adding on to that the extra requirements for dealing with COVID-19. Um, so I will just you know, be real clear that I don't think that's the path to take. I think there are other ways for us to, quote, save money and spend our money wisely because we will get a return back for that. Um, infrastructure is key and our roads are key. Um, it's not safe to walk on the sidewalks and that is, goes back to the older adult issue that I have. Um, it's water is important. That's taken care of by fees. The, but the problem is our water system is really old. And if we don't maintain our fees and probably have to raise rates next year, um, then we're going to be in a heap of problems with everything falling apart slowly but surely. Uh, these are heavy issues for us to deal with. So what's the best way for dealing with it? Well, I'll end with this and then I'll take and I'll be happy to answer questions. I believe that my success has been because the best tool available for, for someone like me is the public. And if I can engage the public, if I can get you all engaged, we will be successful because we will find common values and common ground. And because we find that, then we'll all be on the same train, on the same track, to move forward. But if we pit one person against the other, one opinion against the other, um, it'll just be the powerful who prevail. Um, and it's a combination of the powerful and staff. And here I think, as I said, the greatest tool available for this city are the people. And the engagement of the public is the number one thing that I've uh, tried to encourage everyone to do. I have been literally voted down more times to not do public process than you can possibly imagine. Voted down, not even just ignored, but actually voted down. So I rest my success on your shoulders and you're showing up and you're participating. And, and all I can say is just keep showing up, keep participating, write in. Uh, we need all the help we can get to keep Benicia healthy and strong and good for everyone. All right, Susan, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any.
Hey, that was that was just wonderful. Thank you so much. And I see lots. There are some questions already. People clapping, <laughs> and we have um, one in the chat box. And I'm going to unmute Mary Mary Keens and let her uh, ask her question, and then we'll raise hands. Okay. Go ahead, Mary. Nice. Um, we've only been here two years, so I don't know anything about that uh, housing project you were talking about in Davis, but I have seen some programs on co-housing and wondered if uh, co-housing would work for seniors, even though people would like their individual space and some communal experience, but uh, would need help. And I'm wondering if co-housing would work for seniors or with some seniors in a complex where they could share hiring of some personal help or maybe household help. Whereas like I've been told that some of the agencies, they because of their scheduling of their own workers, they want you to hire somebody for four hours at a time. And you might need a little help here and a little help there and a little help, you know, before you go to bed or when you get up, but not for four hours at a stretch. And I'm wondering, but I don't know what, I think co-housing is usually a uh, private endeavor. I don't know if the city would be involved in something like that or right. for the seniors. So co-housing is a great idea. And that's kind of what the Davis example has. Um, the, uh, they 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 set it up together. So it was they did the planning and the designing and I'll, I'll try to get some information and get it back to you. Uh, one of my dear friends is uh, was the um, executive director of the local government commission, which started in Jerry Brown's first administration. And one of and she lives in Davis. And one of the things they did was um, a project that is famous, Village Homes. And she's very interested uh, in the co-housing. So I will get her, she's the, she'd be a great speaker for you guys, actually. Um, and, I, and I can work with you to get her. She is really terrific. And so I will get information from her, but yes, co-housing for sure. The city wouldn't necessarily get into the business of doing co-housing. Co um, the But what we can do is we can make sure the ordinances provide for it. We can make sure, um, I actually hate zoning <laughs> as a planner. Um, I always considered a straight jacket, a limitation on creativity and things like that. And so what we have done is applied mixed use zoning to much of Benicia. I'd like to see it to all of Benicia, frankly. And uh, what we can do right now is encourage um, additional dwelling units, which are called ADUs. It's the, what we used to call granny units. Um, but in terms of the co-housing, absolutely, it's a great approach. Um, the benefits are just not having that physical help, it's the social help. Right. It's um, people that, I'm an introvert and, um, I know, and, and actually there are a lot of people that go into politics who are introverts, because if you think about it, you gotta read a lot. <laughs> you have to be kind of a policy wonkish person. Um, not all of us, but some of us are that way. And so it would be really healthy for me to be in a co-housing as I get older because you have the shared community area and I love young people. And so that would be fun to see their grandkids coming and all of that. So yeah, no, I'm, um, it, it, uh, any impediments to co-housing uh, should be uh, taken away and, and it should be encouraged. The city could be, um, could, could take a leadership role in attracting the kinds of developers who would build the co-housing. It is not necessarily affordable housing. That's the, that's the trick. So if you can get sub, subsidies coming in to the co-housing, uh, that would probably work for a lot of us. Did that answer your question, Mary? Yes, I think it's something worth exploring. Absolutely. And uh, I think uh, having a, that speaker that you spoke of would be very interesting. Yeah, Judy, Judy, for sure, Judy Corbett. It's this balance between living alone and having your own turf and your own decisions and getting help. And uh, I've been in close contact with a woman, with a couple of people who've been living in, uh, in the, one of the senior facilities. And all I can say is it just hasn't worked because of the isolation 
They've been told to stay in their rooms and they get depressed and they just, I mean, it just because there's a bunch of people living in a building, everybody's got their own apartment. And so they're just told to stay there and isolation has just been cruel. There's right. gotta be some other way for senior housing that can strike a balance. And I'm right. wondering if co-housing mm -hmm. might be an option. Yeah, I, I agree. On all of those points, those are all excellent points. All right, thank you, Mary. Okay. Hand, hand up, Linda. Yes, um, I really wanted to make a comment and to concur with your thought, Elizabeth, about the employees of the city. I was sitting here last night watching the convention. At 7.30, I get a call because I'd left a message for uh, the water department to try to sign up for my payment online. And I couldn't believe that this young lady was calling at 7.30 at night. She said, well, there were so many calls, I thought I'd better go ahead and go the extra mile and call people. So I completely concur. The last place we want to cut is salaries of the wonderful people who work for the city of Phoenicia. Well, you can either submit that in writing or testify. That's a question. <laughs> or testify when we have a discussion. So we'll be doing the study session. I'll send it out, uh, the notice for the study session, and then we'll have the actual uh, readjustments on the uh, budget. For, so this is the second year of a two-year budget, and, uh, and we closed out last year, fiscal year budget, um, and uh, so that so obviously that's done. So this is where the uh, difficult discussion will be, and there are major policy issues, as I was saying. And so the council needs to hear from. I have one particular council member who uh, just I, I I actually implored them not to make it a campaign issue because I I felt that it could be damaging to our staff. And so far, uh, the council has been good. So I can be grumpy sometimes about the council, but I have to say this council um, cares a lot and they're frustrated that they can't do more, uh, but they do individually, they do a lot on their own and coming together will be a challenge, but not impossible. So they're good hearted folks. Okay, um, any other hands? Uh, Judy? Uh, you're on mute. Judy? Judy, you're on mute. Oh, dear. There you go. Okay. So I just wonder, in general, in a very broad brushstroke over the next five years, what do you see as the major issues? I hear you're talking about staff and salaries, and that is certainly one. Uh, I really, I should also take the minute to say I really appreciate what you're doing with Black Lives Matter. Uh, that's really encouraging. So, um, <laughs> I'm thinking about what are the major issues. Well, obviously, <laughs> we have a pandemic. <laughs> we have right. uh, a collapsed economy. Mm -hmm. um, we have fires raging. We have the worst air quality in the world. Was there anything else that you were thinking about? <laughs> um, I would say the major issues, um, all joking aside, um, let's start where it really matters, and that's water. Water is the essence of life. And uh, we, without getting into too much detail, um, uh, I began to have some success in get, getting the public engaged in a participatory process with water. Uh, but unfortunately, that's withered. Um, and so in the early stages of getting the public engaged, um, Pat, there was a presentation by a wonderful consultant, Gwen, and his name is great, you can't ever forget it, it's Gwen Moore Tully. And he, 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 he unequivocally demonstrated that the city of Benicia has a 3% reliable water source. And most people think, oh, we're in state contract and we have like Berryessa and you know, the world is rosy. So one of the reasons I was interested in wastewater treatment was there is no more secure way for getting water supply than wastewater treatment. 
Um, it's mm -hmm. a contained system. And I know uh, the expression of uh, toilet to tap is not attractive. So how about toilet to landscaping, whatever. Um, so water. And the problem with the disconnect uh, that the public has with water is that it's reliable. As Linda was saying, people call up, at, staff calls up at seven o'clock at night, they show up uh, for water leaks and that sort of thing. So that's what you think, you know, just um, it's a simple thing of turning a tap on. So what, what is essential is that we secure a more reliable uh, water supply. And the more reliable supply, water supply is an inner tie with Vallejo. And again, for some long reasons, which are really fun to get into if you want to have another talk about water, is that Vallejo has pre-1914 water rights, which are almost impenetrable by anybody else. And so, and they also have other water sources. So we could do that. That's expensive, inner ties, pipes. Um, and mm. then, um, we have one pipe. Maybe we should have two pipes that come down from the Carquinas uh, mm -hmm. pump station. Um, or it's not Carquinas pump station. It's Cordelia pump station. Um, that's expensive. If we do uh, desalinization, uh, which is cool because we don't have 100% salty water, so we have briny water, and so it's less expensive to do desal. We're talking about $240 million dollars and so if and that's just one example of the cost of water infrastructure and water and wastewater and so the benicia for some reason keeps complaining about water rates well, our water rates are just fine they're right in tune with everybody else's they could be a little bit higher and we could get a little bit more done wastewater is more expensive we think we can figure that out but it's still in the same ballpark they're not exorbitant, but if we don't spend more money, we're not going to have more choices and more reliability. Mm. I am not campaigning on that, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to point out that water fees matter, but it's too much of a burden on the public. Mm. And the reason it's become a burden is because the federal government used to help us build these things, and they have been flatlined for over 35 years. When, when a certain president became president, when a certain person became president, uh, the, they, they just, they stopped raising uh, the funds and it's been flatlined. The state doesn't do very much. We pay, we local government pay 75% of all water that's developed in California, 75%. Mm -hmm. I bet you thought the state paid that. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it does not, it's, it's us, the locals. And it's too much of a burden for, for folks. So we need to change that. In the meanwhile, we don't need to freeze rates. We may need to increase them a bit. But the main thing is to get that uh, federal and state funding. Yeah. Um, so water, start there. That's great. <laughs> and then the reduction in revenues. I think we're, as I said, we're in better shape. We have an industrial park. Let's be smart. Let's grow our clean tech industries because that's 33% of our new jobs in California are clean tech. So let's invest in things that have a future and do the best we can with something that will be slowly but surely dying. And that's the fossil fuel industry. But let, let's not kill it. Just let's make sure that we work our way toward the clean yeah. tech and the jobs of the future while we ease our way out of something that won't be around. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, we'll be in the same position that we were um, when the army pulled out in 1966. And that was, that was, uh, that was the 1929 depression of Venetia was, mm -hmm. was that. Um, okay. Yes, I, what I was looking for was the things that often we citizens don't think of, like when you describe about water. It's just, it's huge. Thank you. So, um, Elizabeth, I don't I want to be respectful of your time. We're a little bit over the hour, but um, if we, do you have time for any more questions or do you need I to do. get on? I'm happy to answer questions. All right. So, it looks like Mary has another question. Just, uh, the how the village and the city work together the village doesn't do a uh, political uh support for things but what what could the city i mean is it 
within the village policies to lobby for something specific uh, in the city government? I just don't know. Right. So as a 501c3, you don't lobby, you educate. And, oh. and, you, and you can, well, you can lobby up to 25% of your uh, contributions, but that's kind of tricky and I wouldn't advise it, but you can educate. And education is uh, the mother's milk for good policy. And um, if you think about most people who get elected to council have never ever worked in government. The reason I got so much done is because I'd worked in government and I knew how it worked. So I didn't, have, I didn't have a learning curve, I just got to work. A lot of people get elected and they don't have that experience. And so your education is really critical. And voices are critical. Um, uh, making sure that your advocacy was, is in the realm of the educational aspect. It's done all the time. I think many of you have experience at this. Um, and, and it's welcomed. So don't, don't hesitate to, uh, to get engaged on that. And then maybe because I'm not going to be in office, I can work, I intend to become a member now that I will have more time, <laughs> I can do things, um, get a dog and be a member, right? Um, so, so I can, so, right, so I can help you with, with that. Um, so I, I, th I thought I saw a hand up here. Yeah, there you go. Lars? Uh, I'm very appreciative of all you've done. There are just so many balls up in the air. Uh, and I'm very concerned when you threw those numbers out, or <clears throat> not threw them out, but offered those numbers, like the industrial park losing what appears to be about 20% of the revenue coming into the city. And what's happening down on First Street, is there any, can you uh, say anything about what the city can do, and, and especially new council members coming on, what can they do to support and, and bring more revenue in given the, the, the virus and what we're experiencing now? I mean, I, I have great concern about the future of the city because everything you're talking about, from my point of view, uh, water, it's related to, to where does the pushback come from? It's too expensive. It's, it's money, 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 money. It's always money. Uh, internet out in the industrial park, it's money, 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 you know. Um, I, it's just a general question. Where could you give some guidance, or what, what can the city do to support the economic well-being of the city, given the experience that we're having right now? I kind of keep what the path that it's on. The as I said, uh, uh, um, I think we have the best city manager we've had, and and then I have participated in a lot of webinars because I, I have not gone through a century pandemic so I'm trying to learn about things that work and aren't working and the advice from um, from the pros is that uh, kind of stay on your planning path don't deviate from that so for instance we have a um, potential hotel project for first street on the empty city lot on East E um, we have uh we are engaged with some state funding we're engaged in a major planning project on east fifth that could bring in that's actually a great site for senior housing and we could bring in some mixed use and and get some additional revenue from from that um the clean tech we through the community sustainability commission under the great uh, leadership of constance butel we had uh two clean tech expos hugely successful doubled the vendors in just one year doubled or more than doubled the participants and that put benicia on the map um i on my own dime i went to the first white house makers fair in in dc to get benicia's name on the list that was the whole idea i wanted manufacturers to know that we existed we exist for manufacturing and we are rare in the Benish, in the Bay Area, and manufacturing is going to bring this country back, and so we're in a wonderful position to enhance that. One of the things that we're spending our um, one-time funds on was another clean tech expo, and um, and I re and I'm hoping that we don't delete, but I 
don't have good vibes about the current council on that. And uh, however, we have an economic team that uh, has gotten this in major publications on uh, our industrial park and the investments. We have more clean tech uh, activities in the industrial park than most people realize. And at the end of the day, the refinery is dependent on a power source. You can use other things and the gears still grind. So a lot of the things that a refinery does does not have to be from fossil fuels. It can be, be a combination of what they call clean diesel, which it does really does exist. It can also be ve vegetable uh, uh, sources, but it can be other sources of energy. One of the biggest firms we have in an industrial park is actually a French nuclear firm, and not because there's nuclear energy there, but because they, drive, they build the drivetrain for running some of the equipment. So that matters. Thinking like that, keeping that planning process moving forward for future returns, uh, making sure we're attracting the businesses for the industrial park that look to the future, uh, do no harm to the refinery as we move forward, uh, but make sure that we are not dependent on the refinery in the future. We, we simply have to uh, get rid of that 20% dependency on the refinery. That is not a healthy dependency. And um, so those are, the, those are what the things that I would do. And feel free to write your letters and comments to the council because they need to hear from you all. All right. All right. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. It's oh, good to see you. all of you. And I expect we'll be seeing you again, hopefully, in person yeah. um, in 2021, probably, right? Yeah. Thank you so much for all you, you've Elizabeth. done and all your years of service to our community. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.